All right, let's bow and pray then. Uh, Father, we are grateful that you've brought us back together another week. We thank you for your love and your goodness. I thank you for the blessing that I've already received from uh, being here this morning in our worship service. Uh, what a good God you are. Uh, Father, we pray for these families and these people that we've mentioned, uh, those needing uh, a physical touch, those facing surgery. Father, we pray that you go before them and uh, you work through the, uh, the people of knowledge, the surgeons and all the technicians to bring about uh, a good result in their surgery. We pray for peace of heart, uh, for Keith and for Jan as they, they face their upcoming surgeries. Pray that those around them will be able to encourage and support and, and help them through this. Father, we pray that we'll be faithful in our prayers for them. We pray for the families that have lost loved ones this week, Father, and are grieving. Uh, we pray that your holy comfort will come upon them. Your presence will be near them. You'll reassure them that uh, this is not the end, that uh, there will be a grand reunion one of these days when we all get to heaven. Uh, Father, lead us this morning in uh, our words, in our study. Uh, bless us, Father. Give us a special, unique blessing from, from studying your word today. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you will, please, turn in your Bibles to uh, Amos chapter 9. We are concluding our study in Amos today. This is the last lesson of, of this little book. And I hope it's been a blessing to you. Today's lesson is entitled Hope. That's a beautiful word, isn't it? Hope. You know, no hope is one of the saddest thoughts that could ever come to my mind. Uh, Psalms 147 says this, The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. And then again in Isaiah 40, 31, one we may be more familiar with, it says, uh, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Your hope in the Lord will renew your strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow uh, weary. They shall walk and not faint. What great blessings those two verses are. And uh, Amos uh, was chosen by God to take a, a very stern message to uh, Israel, the northern tribes of, uh, of Judah. Uh, you know, ten tribes, uh, all but the tribe of Judah. Uh, their time was up. He was coming in judgment, and that was the message Amos had sent to them. I studied a little bit this week. Amos's ministry covers about five years. <laughs> he left his home down here in Tekoa, which is very near Jerusalem, just even south of Jerusalem, to minister to these tribes up here. Now, uh, his, his words were not encouraging, or were they encouraging? Well, today we're going to wrap his words up and we're going to see that God is merciful, that in God we have hope. Even those who are in rebellion can, uh, to God can turn. If they still hear his voice uh, and he's still calling on your heart, you can turn today and go back to God. So let's, let's uh, he, uh, this is the last of five visions. Amos has five visions that he received from God that became his messages to Israel. And this is the last of the five, and this is a stern warning. It starts out very stern, but we'll see God's mercy toward the end of, of, of these verses. Let's look at verses 1 through 4, which are not part of our, our highlighted verses today. Let me just read them. You follow along with me. And This chapter 9 is entitled, Israel Will Be Destroyed. Now, that's, that's a little different from the, what the title of our lesson is. Israel will be restored, and I'm saying hope. <laughs> hope is our lesson so uh, we're going to get to hope but Israel is going to be destroyed verse 1 I saw the Lord standing by the altar and he said strike the top of the pillars so that the threshold shakes bring them down on the heads of all the people those who are left I will kill with the sword uh, not one will get away not one will escape uh, though they dig down to the depths of the grave from there my hand will take them. Though they climb to the heavens, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, Mount Carmel, uh, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from me at the bottom of the sea, there will I command the serpent to bite them. 
Though they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will fix mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. That's tough words, isn't it? That is tough words. This is the righteous judge saying to Israel that your time is up. The sinful people, your time is up. And these are the things that I'm going to do to you that uh, everyone will be accountable to me. There will, there will be no escape. And the vision is where? Where did this vision? I saw the Lord. Where? By the altar. Standing by the altar. Then he talks of... Uh, 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 symbolically of a temple that's going to be struck. Those columns or those pillars. Uh, the altar for Israel, the one that they went to in worship, much of their worship was in Era though. It was it was not honoring to God. Was it Bethel? Where is Bethel? I don't see Bethel. Yeah, right here. That's pretty well south. But there was no temple there. So what is God talking about? Well, it's, it's the same thing. It's the place of worship. These verses are going to apply to the temple in Jerusalem in about another hundred years. But he's saying that altar there is going to be destroyed. It's an abomination to me. It's been misused is what he's saying. It's coming down and not only... See, what, what does the altar symbolize? What does any altar to God symbolize? Sacrifice. Yeah. What else? Worship. What else? Dedication. Yeah. What else? Penance. Mm. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the horns of the altar? <laughs> what were they all about? You go there for what? Mercy. Forgiveness. Mercy and forgiveness. Yeah. Well, God's saying, time's up. Time's up. There's not going to be any mercy and forgiveness for the sinful people. The time is over. Is that true for all people? Though we have a merciful and loving God, your time will one of these days be up. It may be up individually <laughs> when God comes for you, or it may be collectively when God comes again for all of us. There is a time limit. There is a time limit. Uh, if you feel God calling you in your heart, impressing upon you that your way is not right and you need to turn to me, what does he say? Today is the day of salvation. It's near you. Turn today and go to God. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to you. You can't impose. You can't, uh, you can't predict. You can't uh, count on there being another chance. You just can't. That's not the way it works. And that was exactly what's happening here uh, to Israel. So, again, this is the fifth of the five visions. And he's saying that the center of worship, that's where he's going to start his judgment there. Uh, justice begins where? In the house of the Lord. At the house of the Lord. That's yeah. another verse that says. And I think that's always true. It's always true. Why would that always be true? Why would his justice begin at the house of the Lord? What do you assume from people that are attending the house of the Lord? They're right with God. They want to be right with him. Yeah. But what had happened here? They were going to the altar at Bethel to worship, but we've, we studied a week ago that there, or a couple weeks ago, or maybe both times, that there were their worship was was faulty. It was it was prideful. It was more of a celebration of themselves than it was honor to God. Their lives were not backing up what they were saying in worship, and we're going to see some of that in our study today. So, uh, you know, you you go to the altar to worship and to seek forgiveness and to seek fellowship and to honor God, but He's saying no. I'm going to destroy this altar because you've been warned. You've had, he's talking to Israel, you've been warned. You have the written word. You have these prophets there that are reminding you of the written word, and yet still you're disobedient. You're disobedient, even after much warning. So uh, let's go on forward with this. Um, Diane, let's see, Joanne's, how about you reading for me today? Let's read verses 5. Now we see that this is the last vision. 
Uh, Amos is seeing God standing by the altar and he's proclaiming these words of destruction. Let's go on in verse 5 on only, I guess. The Lord, the God of armies, he touches the earth. It melts and all who dwell in it mourn. All of it rises like the Nile and subdues like the Nile of Egypt. Okay. The term, the Lord of armies, is a common term throughout Amos, if, if you uh, uh, remember from our other studies, or if you did a little quick read through, it's only nine chapters, you see that he often says the Lord of armies. Now, what is he talking about that? There's a song that we used to sing, the Lord of angel armies. <clears throat> that, that phrase was used, the Lord of angel armies. Well, he's talking about God's omnipotence and his power. It's talking about uh, how God... Uh, shows himself in great power and he says this God can touch the earth and it will melt now that's power isn't it that's power that's power he says he can raise the earth up and he can sub subdue the earth just like the Nile raises up and goes down the Nile uh, comes out of its banks every year I think it raises about 18 feet which you could imagine in flat land that covers a lot of area but it's a blessing to those people. Why? Well, they know it's coming <laughs> every year. So in that first 18 feet, you know, of, of area, they do what? They raise crops. And every year that Nile dumps fresh dirt, best soil, nutrients on that land. So it's a very fertile area. But as it raises, it, it also goes down. You know, God's not talking about water here. He's talking about the soil, the earth. He can do the same thing with, with the land. Why can he do that? He's God. He is. He's powerful. That's right. He's in, powerful beyond anything we can really imagine. If he spoke creation into being, you know, that, that is a remarkable thing. When you think about God, what are, what are some of the characteristics or attributes of his that uh, are all inspiring to you? Well, for me, it's creation. I go to creation when I think about God, the creator God. You know, uh, if you've ever attempted, <laughs> I won't call it, well, you could say to create something or to come up with an original thought or write an original verse or story or something. In, in the creating experience, it's a difficult and painful process for most people. It's just, you know, gut-wrenching. I was in the business where I had to create machinery. You know, had to design and build machinery. It's a hard process. But when I think about the universe and God spoke that into existence, that speaks volumes to me about the powerfulness of God. Uh, and, and that's what he's getting at here. Uh, read verse 6 for us, please. Joanne. He builds his upper chambers in the heavens and lays the foundation of his vault on the earth. He summons the water of the sea and pours it out over the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. All right. What is God's realm of authority? <laughs> what are the limits of his, his, his authority, his range? What can he see? Yeah, yeah. From, from the upper chambers, which is the highest of the heavens. You know, and we have new telescopes now, and we can see way off into space. Well, I don't think you're ever going to see to the end of it. It's just that vast because God has created that. It's beyond our imaginations. And he says it goes to the lowest of the low, to the center of the earth. Then he speaks of the water cycle. Why is that all inspiring? What's the water cycle? Where does the water rise from? The oceans. From the oceans. <laughs> Makes clouds. You know, if you look at the evening weather <laughs> and, and you see these storms coming across the Atlantic, where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from the equator in Africa. That's where they start. But the, as, they, as these storms get across the ocean, the, what happens? They draw strength and energy and water up, and then it comes on across and it dumps out in gallons. <laughs> it dumps out. That might be the extreme event, but what waters our earth? Water is rise to the heavens, comes across the land, drops on the land, it runs down back to the ocean. Who's in control of that? What if we put man in control of that? 
wouldn't that be a sad situation? Yeah. Man is not in control of that. That's God. As he talks about this, this is more of the creator God. Now what he's saying is you people in Israel who have thun thumbed your nose at God, this is the God that you've been thumbing your nose at and then ignoring and disobeying. This is the all-powerful God. He's in control of all. And he's definitely in control of you. You have a accountability unto God. And it's coming up. That's what he's saying. Any other characteristics of God that inspire you? <coughs> All knowing. Yes. Knows everything from beginning to end, including our thoughts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what did you hear in the sermon this morning? What attribute of God was presented? louder grace grace. Yeah. grace when you think about how he tolerates us <laughs> he tolerates he does more than that you know i keep giving the image of a guy who takes in an orphan puppy and the puppy's just mangy and ugly and ill-mannered and he loves that dog and he he cares for that dog he he, he brings that dog to health. He feeds that dog every day. And then when that dog gets about a year old, it bites him. Every time he comes near, it mistreats him and it bites him. But still, he takes care of that dog. Well, that's a poor image of what God does for us. He brought us from a very low spot in our sins, in our unloveliness, in our... Uh, condition where we thumb in our nose at him, he still loves us and he reached down to us. Now that's an attribute of God I will never get over. Why would he continue to love Israel? Why would he continue to love us? Why would he let America stand when we're doing all we are doing to count it, to, to work against his will? Any other characteristics of God that stand out to you? When you pray, when you worship, think about the characteristics of God. How marvelous they are. How, you know, powerful they are. How all-knowing they are. How loving and merciful they are. And that should swell up in your heart as praise unto God. Read 7 for me, please. Israelites, are you not like the Cushites to me? This is the Lord's declaration. Didn't I bring Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kephator, and the Armenians from Kerr? This is entitled The Shaking. And it starts out uh, by reminding Israel that God is in control of the events. And in particular, where did he bring Israel from? What does he say here? Egypt. Egypt. What were they doing in Egypt? Were they down there on a cruise? <laughs> a 400-year 400, a 400 cruise, weren't they? Why were they down there? Working. Yeah, yeah, slaving. A lot of Slaving. And, and, you know, he had chosen Israel because he had chosen Abraham. And again, from our sermon this morning, there was Abraham, then there was Isaac, and then there was Jacob and all his sons, and they went down to Egypt. Why? Famine. Famine. And they stayed for 400 years. There arose a Pharaoh that showed no favor to Israel. And he put them in bondage, in hard servitude, for hundreds of years. And then God shows up through his servant, who? Moses. And he says, let my people go. I've got a plan for them. I've got a homeland for them up in Canaan, up in the promised land. Let my people go. So he went to Egypt and he brought them out. But he says also here are the Cushites. Now the Cushites are even south of Egypt. You know, our map does. Egypt is way down here behind the last podium. <laughs> and even south of that are the Cushites. And God says, I established them too. And then he said, the Philistines. I brought them up and I put them right here. I brought them from wherever they came from. And then the Armenians. Uh, he brought them and established them in, in their particular place. What he's saying here is all people are accountable to me. That's what he's saying. 
He said, they will answer to me one of these days. All people will answer to me. And he says, uh, you uh, Israelites who have been favored, how were they favored? They were chosen, they were brought, they were given a homeland. How else were they favored? Did they have a contract? <laughs> yeah, they had a covenant. Yeah. They had a covenant, more than one covenant. They had a covenant with Abraham that said, that, you know, I will bless you if you will obey me and follow me. And through you, what? Why am I blessing you? What? The Messiah would come and it would be salvation for all people. That's right. All the world would be blessed. And, and the covenant with David is exactly the same. It's speaking of the Messiah that would come. There would be a ruler out of the line of David that would come and bless the whole world. And through him, the whole world could be saved, could be blessed. So that's what he's talking about. He's reminding Israel that you of all people stand guilty because of what I have shown you and done for you at this point, and you have rejected me and turned your back on me, and for these 10 tribes, or 11 tribes, 10 tribes, your time is up. Your time is up. There's going to, to be punishment. I wanted to write this on the board, but I didn't get it done. Sin leads to what? Death. Okay. As a child of God, sin leads to what? Separation from God. Separation from God. When you are separated from God, that leads to what? Now, you're God's children, but you're rebellious. What does God do? Fellowship. Now, what does God do because you have gone astray? Chasing you. Yeah. He warns you. He sends messengers to you to call you back in repentance. Now, sin separates. God calls you back, then what happens? There's a chance there. You can either repent, turn back to God, or you can do what? You can rebel. If you repent, come back to God, then what happens? Fellowship is again restored. You're restored, that's right. Restored brings great blessing. If you reject God, if you rebel against Him, then what happens? Continued rebellion. What happens? Prepare to meet an angry God. So that's the sin cycle, and it, it, it repeats itself over and over in our lives. We sin, God convicts us in our heart that we've sinned. We repent, we come back to Him. How do you look at God's uh, discipline in your life? Do you look at it as one of these uh, angry kids that will... Hold his breath, stomp his feet. <laughs> well, in truth, you and me both do that for a short time. <laughs> we, we, nobody likes discipline. And the scripture tells us, you know, discipline is not a fun thing. But then, after giving some time to digest that discipline, what comes upon you if you're a child of God? Conviction. Conviction, and then what? Repentance. And then what? Restoration. And then what? Yeah. Your love for God is renewed. Your fellowship is restored. Just think about you and your children. It's the same thing if you love that child, and that child loves you. Sometimes that love is separated by troubles. But when it is restored, how sweet that restoration is. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that's true with God. And that, again, just speaks of his grace, his marvelous, unending grace for us. How many times have you sinned? <laughs> we don't have enough time to go through that list, do we? How many times have you sinned? How many times have you repented? But how many times has God said, I forgive you? Every time. Every time. And that's his promise, isn't it? That's his grace. That's his promise. It's, it's just an attribute of God I will never get over. It's just amazing. Let's read verses 8 through 10, Joanne. Look, the eyes of the Lord are on the sinful kingdom, and I will obliterate it from the face of the earth. However, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, for this is the Lord's declaration. For I am about to give the command, and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations. 
as one shakes a sieve, but not a pebble will fall to the ground. All the sinners among my people who say, disaster will never overtake or confront us will die by the sword. sword. All right, he says, I am about to obliterate it from the face of the earth. That goes back to his first four verses. You know, time is up. The wrath of God is coming. And then what does he, he kind of describes how this is, uh, is going to happen. This is where hope shows up, people. <laughs> this is where hope shows up. It says, however, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. Then he gives the vision of a sieve. Do you know what a sieve is? If this basket had a wire bottom in it, a wire mesh bottom, and I put some grain, maybe wheat, and there were some stones in there, and I was to shake this thing, the wheat would fall out, but the stones and the trash would stay, and they would be dumped. Now, that's exactly the picture he's saying that he's going to do to Israel. Now, who are the seeds that he's going to save? Who are the seeds? And who are the stones? All right, the pebbles represent the sinful people, the sinners, those who say, I will never be overtaken or, or confronted. Uh, they're going to die. In other words, the, the seeds then, the wheat, are the remnant of the, of, of the people of Israel who have not forsaken him, and he's going to save them. But he's not going to save them in this promised land. What's he going to do with them? What's it say? They're going to be shaken where? Among the nations. Among the nations. They're going to be scattered out. They're going to be scattered out. Part of the penalty for the sin of the nation was that their homeland would be lost. Their orchards and vineyards and flocks and their houses would be lost. But what was not lost by these people? The covenant relationship they had with God. The protection of God. Mm -hmm. They were going to be a remnant, but they were going to be scattered. And that's exactly uh, the picture of, uh, of the Jews today. They are scattered among all the nations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, they're still rebellious. But what God is talking about here is that remnant that he always preserves. And this is a remnant who have not forsaken him. Even though the country was going to fall, even though they were going to be great loss and much death, he's speaking of the death of sinners here, they would not totally be destroyed. However, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. Why would he not totally destroy the house of Jacob? Because of the covenant. Exactly. Because of his promises. God's promises never fail. His word never fails. He promised Abraham that, that he would do these things. He promised David that he would look after uh, Israel and always there would be a ruler that would come from his line that would always uh, be on the throne and he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and then he goes on to explain how he's going to do this do you get the picture of what Amos is saying I can only see Amos shaking the ship and he says you sinful people you stones you who have re re rejected God and are not honoring him you're going to die by the sword but he says there's a faithful few. Are there always a faithful few? There is. There is. That's why we're here. <laughs> there was a faithful few who carried the message uh, to our ancestors, who brought the message to us. So there's always a faithful few. Uh, let's see how he's going to receive. Any questions there? They asked a question here in the book. Why do many people consider themselves exempt from God's judgment? Why do people think they will not be judged? In other words, these are probably the people says that all people go to heaven. That's the kind of way it's expressed today. All people go to heaven. Or if I have more good works than this basket than I have bad works than that basket, I'm going to heaven. Why do people think they're exempt? They don't understand God's grace and our sinful nature. All right. They choose not to believe. Yeah, yeah. 
they, do, they choose not to believe in God. They choose not to believe that they are sinful people in need of a God, in need of a Savior. That the wages of sin is death. All sin is an affront to God. Sin cannot exist in the presence of God. We need a solution. He sent us a solution in Jesus Christ who cleanses us and makes us acceptable to be in his presence. And it's not just you and me. <laughs> it's not just Israel. It's not just the Kushites or the Armenians. It's everybody will give an account before God who is their creator. You know, if for no other reason, it's because he's our creator. <laughs> We're his creation, his possession. We owe accountability to him. Any thoughts about that as we go on? You're all quiet today. <laughs> 11 and 12, Joy. In that day I will restore the fallen shelter of David. I will repair its gaps, restore its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name. This is the declaration of the Lord. He will do this. So he says, I'm not going to destroy all of Israel, but I'm going to do what? In that day, what's he going to do? There's two high points in history that certainly affect all men and certainly affected Israel. One of them was the Garden of Eden creation. And for Israel, it was the uh, kingship of David. That was their high point as far, far as their service to God, and he had blessed them. Uh, in David's day, uh, Moab and uh, uh, Ammon and all these other surrounding countries were Edom were pushed back. Uh, they were afraid of David. <laughs> he had whipped them soundly, and they were pushed back. And therefore, Solomon had a great 40 years of peace because of what uh, David had done. They were secure in their homeland. Well, that's what he's talking about here. I'm going to restore that fallen house or shelter of David. He says, I'm going to build the walls back up. You're going to feel secure as in the days of old. And they will possess the land, even the lands where their enemies had been before. Now, what he's actually saying there is those people in those lands will also have a chance through Jesus Christ to come to salvation in God, not just Israel. One of the great failings of Israel was they thought that God was exclusively theirs and the other people, the Gentiles, were not worthy of knowing anything about God. But as you read through all of the Old Testament, you will see that God always included the foreigners and uh, always had a... a, a uh, a message for them and uh, had a, a way, a means for them to also worship him and come to him. They were, they were never to be rejected. So he's talking about what he's going to do. This is the millennial blessing that will come. We're going we're to read just a little more and explain that to you just a bit more here in a minute. Read 13 through 15 and we'll conclude our verses. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration when the plowman will take will overtake the reaper and the one who treads grapes and um, the sower of seed. The mountains will drip with sweet wine and all the hills will overflow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They will rebuild and occupy ruined cities, plant vineyards and drink their wine, make gardens and eat their produce. I will plant them on their land, and they will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them. The Lord your God has spoken. All right, now think about it. Amos, for five years, has been preaching that the judgment of God is coming. The judgment of God is coming. Look at what you've been doing, people. Look how you have neglected God and forsaken Him. How you are mistreating your neighbor. How are you selling your neighbor? Uh, into uh, poverty and, and into servitude, how you take advantage of, of other people. Uh, you know, you, uh, we, we, we talked about the cows of Basham a couple of weeks ago, how you wanted your nest feathered 
you know, you wanted all the best and you didn't care if you had to step on the poor man to get it. Now, all that is opposed to God's message to these people. And they're glad to live that way. And Amos has been confronting them and confronting them. But now, here in his last chapter, his five years about up, I guess he gets to go back to Tekoa, gets to go home after this, I guess. <laughs> he's probably looking for that. But he's saying there's hope. There's hope in the Lord. There's hope in the Lord that you who are faithful, you who the Lord has chosen, that goes from our sermon this morning, and called out, you who have remained faithful will be preserved. Although there are going to be great loss, you're going to be preserved. And in the end, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to restore Israel. And he's talking to Israel. Here. He's not necessarily talking to all Christians. He is talking to Israel here. But we join in that blessing as Christians now, as the engrafted vine. He says, in those days, there's going to be what? There's an abundance. See, he's painting a picture here of, of the abundance that will happen in those days. David's house will be restored. That's saying there will be a great king, is the way I read that. And who will that great king be? The king of kings and the lord of lords. It will be Jesus Christ. And then he's also pointing, painting a picture of great abundance. The seasons are overlapping. What if you had a, you know, I, I tried to grow some beans and, and uh, tomatoes every year. What if they did so well that they carried right on through, and the next spring when it was time to replant, I was still picking beans and tomatoes. Well, that's the picture he's got here. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Wouldn't that be something <laughs> that they carried over? That when it's time to plow again, you still have... Abundance of crops in the field. That's what he's talking about. What does what does that show? What what is that a picture of? How about the mountains flowing uh, with wine? What is that showing? God will provide. You know, have, yeah, and in abundance, mm -hmm. in abundance. Mm -hmm. There's many verses that says He will bless us in abundance if we follow His ways. Above you know, that which we can ask or think. Yes, mm -hmm. how about that? That's what God wants to do for us. That's how he wants to bless us. It's amazing hope. Absolutely. It, it, you know, every single, every single one of these is hope. How many years later we're reading this? <laughs> yeah, I, I look old, but I wasn't around when the Bible was. Not quite that old, yeah, okay. Old. All right. But seriously, even now it gives me goosebumps, you know? It, we have hope. No matter what we see today, which is a little on the crazy side, especially if you live in California, um, but hope, what, the reason that it was written down was to encourage us all these centuries later. Yeah, and think about the people that, the remnant that was gonna be saved. They did lose houses, they lost their land, they probably lost family members, but do you see, just what Patty's saying here, they have hope. They have hope. They are not forsaken. That remnant is not forsaken. No matter how bad their situation. That speaks to us too, does it not? You know, in America, we are blessed abundantly. Amen. I wonder if we're Israel just before Amos showed up. We're blessed abundantly. But are we honoring God? Do we acknowledge that those blessings, every good and perfect gift comes from God? Oh, I shudder when I think about that. Are we Israel just before Amos shows up and says, prepare to meet your God? You're going to lose your house and your land and so on and so forth. But have hope. Have hope. You remnant, you people who, who honor me, whose goal and uh, focus in life is to serve me the best they can and obey me and treat others fairly, to be benevolent to the poor, to be loving to the weak and the defenseless, who love justice and who love mercy. Take hope because I'm coming again. And in that day, there's going to be abundant blessings that will make you forget about all that other. <laughs> it will be so abundant. Now, as we look at all history, when will this happen? When will Israel be sure that they will never be removed from their homeland? 
Well, they've got enemies galore today, don't they? It would be the delight of all these nations about them, the Arab nations, if they were gone. They're a thorn in their side. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, that right in itself is an amazing act of God. That little tiny nation has been given enough authority and power to withstand the hordes that are on every side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's God's blessing. And how we think of Israel uh, is very important too. Very important because they're God's chosen people even though they may be sinful. Well, this will happen in the, when Jesus comes again. When he comes again, what happens? History is over. Time stops. This is a new creation, a new revelation, a new kingdom under the new king. So even after much, much gloom and doom, God allowed Amos to have a, a message of hope in the end. You think that warmed Amos's heart? I think it did. After all uh, the gloom that he had to, to share with them. Now, that concludes our verses. Any, anybody have any comments about that? That's during the millennial reign, correct? Co correct. A thousand year reign. One question here to the end of my book is, how does the promises of God's future blessing motivate believers to endure, it says God's discipline. I'm going to say endure today. <laughs> How does the promise of God's future blessings motivate you today? There's hope. There you go. No matter what sickness comes, no matter if you have that bad car accident, no matter if um, family deserts you, turns their back on you, there is hope in Jesus. He will never. How about if God be for us? Who can be against that's us? right that's right even though we lose it all we're never going to lose our salvation in jesus christ we're never going to lose god's love and and care now folks that is liberation that is liberation from the cares and the worries of this world um it's said and i, I don't identify with it myself but i may one of these days that uh, most men live in dreadful fear of death. Men and women live in fear of death. They're, they're, they try not to think about it. They try to run from it. They, they're just scared to death of it. They don't understand what's going to happen. In Jesus Christ, <laughs> you can promise yourself, you can promise others that he will meet you and carry you over to a blessed reward. So you don't have to be afraid of death. Matter of fact, in many ways, for the Christian, it is absolutely victory. It's graduation day is what it is. I heard someone say the other day, and it helped me tremendously, he was talking about death. And he was saying that, uh, you know, Jesus said you will never see death. And I thought, well, you know, you die, you're going to see death. But he said, when you take that last breath, that you're not going to see it. You don't just be transported right then and not see any death. Yeah. I, I just thought yeah. that was so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know, yeah. you won't see it. You're gonna... Well, in Psalms 23, it says we only know the shadow yeah. of death. Mm -hmm. We don't have to, you know, yeah. there's no, a shadow can't hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you go through the shadow. You don't go through death. Yeah. So that's an encouragement. Yep. This is the way I see Jesus holding on to me. And death is not going to mean he turns loose of me, and then he comes fine. No, he's going to walk with me right on through death. He's never going to turn loose of my hand. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not ready to go. <laughs> I'm not getting a load up. Yeah, I'm not getting a bus load up. Let's all just, you know, go die today. No, no. But I am not going to sit and worry about death. It's not death that frightens me. It's all the stuff leading up to the Lord. May I be faithful till I get there. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to fail you, Lord. You've, you've been such a blessing to me. May I not fail in these last days, whatever the number of them are. But you know, Terry, it would be really. 
I know Jesus is sufficient for everything, but if we were all going together, I would like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of you, let's go. Even so, Lord, come today. That's yeah, it. That's the thought. Yeah. You know, the rapture, you know. there's no pain there. That's right. Here and then gone. That's right. I'm ready to fly. Yes. Let's <laughs> fly. Let's go. Here are some observations as we close from Amos. These came out of my a teacher's book. Uh, you may have some others, but here are some of his observations. Number one, God sometimes uses unlikely people to do his work. Well, he's talking about Amos. Amos didn't come out of a seminary. You know, he wasn't, he didn't sit at the feet of the scholars. He came from the, the flock, from the fields, from the orchards, you know, the sycamore water tree that, that he tended. Eddie made a great statement. He says, God is looking for those who are faithful, available, and teachable. Bad Christians is what he wants. Yeah. <laughs> faithful, available, and teachable. That's great. I, I would put one more, obedient. You know, uh, we get many calls from God, and I think some of them we answer right away, some of them we argue with, maybe some we never ever say yes to. But as we are available, he will use us. He will give us a ministry. He will give us a, a, a way to glorify him. Number two, every nation is under the authority of God and will answer to him for their actions, including America. All nations. Number three, great blessing brings great responsibility. As his chosen people, God had Israel to a higher standard than he did other nations. Now, I question that one. Is that true? What were the standards that they were held to? Israel was held accountable to God's word. What he had given them, but to other nations, he had not given them his word, and they were not held accountable to it like Israel was. Is that what you're asking? Exactly. Who was given the covenant promises? Israel. Israel. Who was given the the covenant of, of David's promise. Israel was given that, and they were accountable to what had given them. Now, the word of God has gone out. We are not Israel. We're not under the covenant that Israel had. We were not part of the kingdom that David had, but we've got the word, and we are responsible to the word as it speaks to our hearts, as God speaks through it to us, so we are accountable. And, and even now, the word, those who have been called to teach or preach are held more accountable than, you know, the rest of the population. That's right. Do you think as Christians, we're held to a higher standard? We are, aren't we? We are, aren't we? Now, as Christians, when we fail to live up to that standard, have we lost our salvation? No, it's not that. You know, uh, my child will always be my child, whether they're doing what I want them to do or not. <laughs> you know, and by your Christian birth, by your salvation, you are always God's chosen, peculiar treasure, his children. But it does affect our fellowship, and we will give an account for, for before God of our, our works on this in this life. Number four, God expects his people people's worship to be an expression of sincere devotion to him and his word. Let's go on. The day of the Lord will be a dark, uh, a day of darkness and calamity for anyone who is ungodly. It's coming. There will be judgment. There will be coming. Six, it is impossible to offer acceptable offering to God and at the same time take advantage of others or neglect those in need. Your greatest worship is not done in this building. Your greatest worship is what's done as you live your life. When others are not looking, when you are exposed to somebody in need, somebody who needs a kind word, as you offer that kind word to that person, you are honoring God. You are worshiping, showing worth to God. How you live your life uh, every moment of every day can be a worship to God. Number seven, when people are unfaithful to God and lack concern for others, God's judgment is imminent. And there will be a severe consequence for such behavior. You know, we are commanded to do what? To love God, first commandment, with all that we are, and then what's the, the second, like it, we are to love what? 
Okay. Others. 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 A neighbor just don't mean the people I like or the people next door. It means everybody that God brings me into in, to contact with. Those are my neighbors. Those are the ones that I might be able to help. Where are we at here? Number eight. Number eight. God's message of judgment through his, his messengers is a demonstration of his mercy and grace. Had a pastor one time that... <laughs> that always hammered on his congregation. Yeah, he, he never praised them. He always hammered on them. Now that's probably how they looked at Amos when he showed up. You know, you got you need to go on home. I'm going to find me a, 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 a pastor that uh, tickles my ears and says good things, tells me what a good person I am. Well, I never, ever am going to tell a pastor what he's supposed to be preaching as long as he's preaching from the Word. You know what I'm saying? If he's in the word, if it's a hard message, it's going to do me some good if I listen to it. Terry, let me tell a quick story yeah. about that. Okay. Uh, there was a church that was noted for running off their pastors. Yeah. They didn't like what he was preaching, just like they didn't like what Amos was saying. Yeah. All right, so they ran them off, and they got another pastor. They had, this happened many times. They got another pastor, and he stayed. And the people, and one of the men says, he asked one of the members, he says, why is it that y'all haven't run me off? He said, well, the other preacher, when they would preach it, they, uh, that we were going to the place of torment if we didn't repent. He says, that they preached that to us. And he says, you have too, but you didn't act like you were glad. Yeah, that's good. In my mind, a pastor should preach the whole gospel, but there's some good news in there too. Give me that good news too. You know, just tell me what a lousy sinner I am all the time. Give me some good. Give me some hope. And here's number nine. That's his hope. God would someday restore and bless His people through the person and work of the Messiah. Hallelujah! Praise God. In and through Christ, God would bring about His eternal plan of salvation for all those who will believe. Now, the remnant. God used the faithful remnant of Abraham's seed, yeah. even though, <laughs> even though many of them fell away, many of them didn't care, but there was a remnant, there's always a faithful remnant seed as an instrumental part of his plan. Well, that's where we are, folks, today. Let us be an instrumental part of God's plan. I hope Amos has been a blessing to you. I've got a word from my sister. She she enjoyed it. She received a great blessing from Amos. It's a little book that's often overlooked, but it's got a, a message. Isn't it uh, just amazing? Maybe it's not, but it is to me. How the book of Amos speaks to our condition today. Speaks to our condition today. And in the blackness that we see. Why do, how do we see blackness? Because we've seen the light. That's why it looks black and dark, because we've seen the light. We see the contrast. But don't focus on the darkness. Focus on Christ and focus on the hope that we have in him. Anything to say as we go. I've got 30 seconds to pray, and I'll get you out of here. <laughs> hey, Lisa. I just had to join because my class was early. Okay. Yeah. You are always welcome in this class anytime. This is Lisa. She snuck in. She's one of my good friends, and I appreciate her. All right, let's pray and we'll go home. Father, we thank you for the study that we've had, these, these four lessons. Uh, thank you for always speaking through your word to our need at this moment. Father, help us never uh, lose the sight of what a loving and merciful God you are. But help us always to remember that there will be a day of accountability and that there are things that you have ordained for us to be doing as we wait on your return. Help us to encourage all of those, Father, to come unto you in sal uh, for salvation. Help us to live a life before them that will make them hungry and thirsty for you. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And come to dinner on Thursday night. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs>